Well, if you would, open your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 12 to 19. And I want to begin by reading the text. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. This is from the Apostle Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. The epistle, 1 Peter, is written to Christians who were in the midst of suffering for their faith. And that has typically made preaching this epistle somewhat awkward. Since suffering as a a Christian in our society has been a rather rare occurrence. And even when it has taken place, it hasn't been systemic. It's been isolated and directed at the individual where a, a Christian might experience mild suffering at the hands of their family or in the workplace. And even in times past, as we have, as a local church have talked about persecution, we've talked about it as something that is yet to come, something to be anticipated until now. Never has the message of 1 Peter been more timely for us here in our country and province. And I know someone will say, James, what's taking place in our day is universal, impacting believer and unbeliever alike, and that is true. But at least two things must be kept in mind. One, state oppression is often universal. See Daniel 3, Daniel 6. In both cases, what was either commanded or prohibited impacted Jew and Gentile alike. And two, it is the Christian's allegiance to Christ that demands noncompliance. The unbeliever has no obligation to resist the unjust edicts of the state. They can fall in line. The follower of Christ can't. Specifically when obedience and faithfulness to Christ puts us at odds with our government or society. And at very least, we're at the early stages of this in our country. Where opposition and hostility toward us will be ever increasing and where the Judeo-Christian society we once enjoyed is utterly dismantled. It's being dismantled as we speak even by those who claim to be Christian. And that's what makes the message of 1 Peter so timely. 1 Peter was written at a time when basic Christian living made it virtually impossible for believers to go unnoticed. You can see this in chapter 4. Look at verse 3. 
For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, notice, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation or reckless abandon, and they malign you. By simply abstaining from basic expressions of immorality, Peter's readers were openly reviled. Christian living was so distinct at that time that it was unavoidable to live a faithful Christian life stood out like an incredibly clean shirt. That's how distinct Christian living was at that time. You see, we've enjoyed a a society where the Christian ethic has been largely accepted, even normal. But all of that is being reversed, and we are heading into a time when the uncompromising Christian will be just as recognizable as Peter's readers. Which means what? Allegiance to Christ is going to result in suffering. In fact, I think we can safely say it already has. Suffering has already begun. And so we need to ensure we're thinking biblically about suffering so that we suffer well according to the will of God, glorifying him in the midst of it. And that's exactly what Peter's aim is in this text. He wants his readers, and by extension us, to think biblically about suffering. And so we're going to see five crucial instructions with respect to suffering. Five crucial instructions with respect to suffering that we would suffer according to the will of God. And if you're taking notes, jot down first the expectation of suffering. The expectation of suffering. This comes out in verse 12 where it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. You see, Peter is establishing the inevitability of suffering. And the suffering he has in mind here is that which is unjust. He isn't talking about trials in general. He's talking about suffering for one's faith. And this is evident throughout the passage, verse 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. Verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ. Verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, Peter is underscoring the inevitability of persecution. And this is consistent with the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. And to be persecuted is to be harassed for one's beliefs. And one's beliefs will always shape their conduct. And so Peter is saying, do not be surprised when it comes. In fact, look at what he writes in the last portion of the verse. As though some strange thing were happening to you. Which is to say two things. One, suffering for one's faith in Christ should neither be considered strange nor foreign. Even our Lord and Master himself had a a, a road marked by suffering. And two, it, it serves a divinely ordained purpose. The suffering that we experience for our faith in Christ doesn't take place by mere happenstance. It is providentially administered by the hand of God. You say, for what purpose? For your testing, 
Look at the middle of verse 12, which comes upon you for your testing to learn the nature or character of your faith. Suffering unjustly tests the integrity of your faith in Christ. And we know that when suffering like this comes, some will fall away. We've witnessed in our own midst people walk away from the Lord without suffering. Just imagine what will take place in our day as suffering comes. They will, there will be many like those whom Jesus refers to in Mark 4, 16 and 17, who initially received the word with joy, but have no firm root in themselves and fall away in persecution. And the imagery Peter uses for this testing is that which is typical, fiery ordeal. Look again at the beginning of verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Now some believe this fiery ordeal refers to the persecution Peter's readers would have experienced under Nero. History has it that Nero wanted to rebuild Rome, and so he set the city on fire. And when public backlash came, he, he blamed it on the Christians who were a reasonable scapegoat since they had already been deemed hostile to the immorality of Roman culture. And historians tell us that in the persecution of that time, Christians were burned at the stake, lit up like torches in public. And so on account of that, some believe the fiery ordeal is referring specifically to that point in the distress, that point in the persecution. But when Peter mentions the fiery ordeal, he's not likely referring to that. First Peter was likely written prior to the onset of that persecution, the intensity of it. This epistle gives really no evidence that his readers were being martyred for their faith. And so the fiery ordeal is metaphorical. It's drawing on the imagery of metal being tested and refined by fire, where fire both tests its integrity and further purifies it. Peter wants us to think biblically about persecution, that it's to be expected, that when it comes, we aren't to be surprised as if some strange thing were happening, but to recognize that it comes to us for our testing and therefore serves a divinely intended purpose. Now, Peter is instructing us in thinking biblically about suffering. So why is this so crucial? Why would it be so crucial for us to have the right expectation about suffering, that it's not to be taken as a surprise when it comes upon us? Well, for one, when it comes, we might think, God, we're displeased with us. That suffering for our faith step with God. And so we might be tempted to shrink back to bring the suffering to an end. And we've seen many churches respond that way in this season. And for two, to keep us from seeking a, a swift remedy to it. What's the natural tendency anytime you experience something unpleasant? It's to, to bring an end to it as quickly as you possibly can. Even when suffering is necessary to, to bring it to an end as quickly as possible, especially since it's so foreign to us. And that too can result in sinful compromise. You see, remaining in the fire, in the, the furnace of affliction, is not an easy thing. It's difficult. But when we embrace the inevitability of suffering along with its divinely ordained purpose, we have reason to stand firm, to be immovable, with full assurance of faith that we're right where God wants us to be. And I think we're right on time. There are a number of churches all over this province and around this country that are asleep right now haven't got the foggiest idea what is actually taking place. 
And I believe that they will join the the party, as it were. They're going to be late to the party. They may look at us and think that we were early, and we'll say, no, you're late. (laughs) But at that point, it won't even matter. We're right on time, right where God wants us to be. That's the expectation of suffering. Now, second, if you're taking notes, jot this down, the exaltation of suffering. The exaltation of suffering. And this is where we see that our suffering is tethered to the sufferings of Christ. Verse 13. But to the extent that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Now, this is incredibly counterintuitive. Suffering as a Christian isn't an occasion for disbelief or wonder or astonishment. Instead, it's reason to rejoice. Notice the way verse 13 even begins, because it even emphasizes that the greater the suffering, the greater the rejoicing. Look at it, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. The word rendered share there is the Greek word koinoneo, and that should sound familiar to you. It's the the word that we get fellowship from. It can also be rendered participate, such that Peter would be saying here, the degree to which you participate in the sufferings of Christ is the degree to which you are to rejoice. And what's amazing is that the call here to rejoice is a command. This is an imperative. Peter is exhorting us to rejoice. When we share in the sufferings of Christ, a command is sent to us from the throne of heaven. Rejoice, Christian. Now, his sufferings here don't refer to that which he suffered when he atoned for our sins. Glory be to God. We have no share in that suffering. Instead, the suffering Peter has in mind is that which results out of our allegiance to Christ. It's our devotion to Christ that that leads us into this suffering. Just as Christ suffered in his allegiance to the Father, But it's worth pointing out that this isn't calling us to enjoy suffering per se. Suffering is still suffering. Suffering is difficult. Suffering is unpleasant. The the truth that we're seeing here in verse 13 and 14 isn't to make us gluttons for suffering, as it were. Instead, we're to rejoice because of what present suffering says about our future. Second half of verse 13, so that purpose, also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Rejoicing in one's present sufferings is for the purpose of being overjoyed at the revelation of Christ's glory. The Lord is coming back, amen? And so suffering now points us forward to what will take place when his glory is revealed, and we're to rejoice now because when he comes, our joy now will become exceeding joy later. Which means this, and this ties back into Mark 4, 16 and 17, what happens to those who have no firm root that sharing in Christ's sufferings and rejoicing to the degree that you do is a mark of a true Christian. One of the marks of a true Christian is that you will rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ and even to the degree that you do. 
so that when Christ returns, you have no reason to shrink back, but can rejoice with exceeding joy. Listen to 1 John 2.28. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. To abide in Christ is to rejoice to the degree that you share in his sufferings. In fact, listen to the way the Apostle Paul says this. Romans 8, 16 and 17, listen, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if, note this, if, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. There, Paul is connecting the future glorification of the believer with suffering with Christ now. Future glorification with Christ is conditioned on our willingness to suffer with Christ in the present. And so again, participation in the sufferings of Christ is a mark of of a believer, and that's why we ought to rejoice. Because suffering with Christ is evidence we're in him. Following in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and all of those who have suffered for for Christ throughout the centuries. And then, when he appears, In the fullness of his glory, we will have every reason to rejoice with exceeding joy, with exaltation. I mean, just anticipate that moment. The Lord could return even now, and you would have no reason to shrink back. You would have no reason to do anything but rejoice and exalt in the the coming of Christ the realization of your your inheritance in him. And Peter further develops this as a mark of a true Christian in verse 14. He says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. To be reviled for the name of Christ is to be insulted and to receive reproach and mockery for the name of Christ is to be insulted for one's devotion to him. And notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say if you are reviled for the gospel of Christ, although it certainly includes that. No, this is more broad than that. It's being reviled for the name of Christ. And to be reviled for his name is to be reviled due to our allegiance or association with him. Where we're being reviled for living in a manner consistent with his name, consistent with who he is. And notice what it says about those who are reviled in this way. Middle of verse 14, you are blessed. This is a beatitude. And Peter, no doubt, had the Sermon of the Mount in view. Listen to Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted for the gospel, righteousness sake, For the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecution isn't just persecution when it's directed at the gospel. Persecution is persecution when it's for righteousness. Because righteousness is consistent with his name. He is righteous. Righteous. 
The next two verses, Matthew 5, 11 and 12, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of Jesus, because of me, he says. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know what's amazing? That when you look throughout Israel's history, Israelites and false prophets persecuted the true prophets. That was common throughout Israel's history. And I think we're seeing that happen even today. That the false prophets of Christ are now coming out in in droves to condemn the true followers of Christ, the, the true spokesmen for Christ. And they're just falling into the same error that the Israelites did in times past. This season, as we'll see momentarily, is exposing the true from the false. We'll see that's what it's intended to do. And so when evil is spoken of us on account of our devotion to Christ, we are immeasurably blessed and eternally so. But Peter gives an additional reason why we're blessed. Last clause of verse 14. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now that language is somewhat unique. Because we typically think of the spirit dwelling in us, not resting on us. And this language likely reaches back to Isaiah 11.2. Where prophetically... The Spirit was foretold to rest upon the Messiah, Christ. And in a way akin to that, the Spirit rests on us. The Spirit of glory and of God. You see, being reviled for the name of Christ, being reviled for the sake of righteousness is evidence that the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I mean, just think about the heart of man. The heart of man, he's dead in his trespasses and sins. He is a product of the the world system, that system put in place by Satan. Satan utterly hates the spirit of glory and of God. And those who are in their sin are captive to that system. They're of their father, the devil. And so when they see in a way that they can't even describe the spirit of Christ resting upon a true follower of Christ, it provokes in them hostility. And if the spirit of glory and of God rests on you, then you are truly blessed. Because it is only by the power of the Spirit that you could ever be faithful in the face of hostility. Who in their right mind would choose a a path of suffering and hostility? Who in their right mind would lay hold of Christ and, and be devoted to Him and walk in allegiance to Him in the face of the culture's hatred? None of us would. But the Spirit of God rests on us. He is in us and he compels us to press on, putting one foot in front of the next. To live a life honoring to Christ. Again, the instruction in these verses is vital. If we're to rejoice in suffering, why? Well, we've already touched on it. Suffering is unpleasant. It's not the suffering itself that we're to rejoice in. It's what the suffering says about our future. There's all kinds of difficulty that all of us are going through in this season to just come to church. And there's there's certainly something in us, I'm sure, that would be tempted to avoid it altogether, to find a way to bypass the the suffering and the difficulty. 
And yet the Spirit is compelling us to be faithful to Christ and to, to continue to press on and walk in obedience to Him. But the future, the future exaltation, the future glory, the future joy, our future with the Lord Jesus Christ, in his presence, the the presence of his glory, where we'll be blameless with great joy, that is reason to rejoice. And so we need our minds to be properly instructed, to be able to process suffering, so that when it comes and we experience the unpleasantness of it, we have reason to then look to the future and what the suffering says about what's coming. In fact, just look back at 1 Peter 1.13. Notice the way the mind is engaged in We can't be driven by our feelings. Peter says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is a grace that is going to be brought to you if you are in Christ at his revelation. And this is a grace that you've already experienced now through faith in him, where you've experienced the forgiveness of your sins and the cleansing of your conscience. But at that time, You will experience and know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that is profound, visible. Where you'll experience comfort and joy and blessing, never ending. And so, because present suffering points forward to future exaltation. We can rejoice in it. We can heed and obey the command here to rejoice. So we've seen the expectation of suffering, that suffering is inevitable. We've seen the exaltation of suffering, that we're to rejoice in it knowing what it says about our glorious future. Now third, If you're taking notes, the exception for suffering. The exception for suffering. There's a kind of suffering that we're not to suffer. Verse 15. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. It's one thing to suffer unjustly. It's entirely another to suffer for wrongs done, wrongs committed. And so Peter wants to ensure that a believer's only crime, as it were, against either society or the state is their obedience to Christ. And he identifies four expressions of wrongdoing, the first three being rather straightforward. Believers aren't to suffer as murderers. We aren't to take the life of another. Or as thieves, we're not to steal. Or as evildoers, denoting a broader category of wrongdoing. Clearly things that are not appropriate in the life of the Christian. But the fourth expression is one deserving of greater attention. The one rendered troublesome meddler a word occurring nowhere else in the New Testament, nowhere in the Septuagint, which is the the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and nowhere in other Greek literature prior to 1 Peter. And it's a compound word combining the words overseer, episkopos, and another. And therefore, would seem to mean overseeing the affairs of another. But since it's an expression of evil doing, it's better understood as meddling in the affairs of another. Something akin to being a busybody. And that's why the NASB employs troublesome meddler 
The ESV just says meddler. The New King James says a busybody in other people's matters. And so the Christian must not be a troublesome meddler. You aren't to be a meddler in the affairs of others. So far as it depends on you, you are to lead a tranquil and quiet life, working with your own hands, not leading an undisciplined lifestyle. But a number of sources see this word as bleeding into political activism, where the Christian ought never to suffer as a political revolutionary. And though I'm not certain that's what this word means, there's a a sense in which we need to deal with the, the issue that that discussion even raises. There's a tension if this word is ruling out political revolution. What's the tension? Whether or not we're involved in a political revolution. And make no mistake about it, we aren't. We're simply doing what we've always done. It's the political climate around us that is undergoing a revolution. Not only are we in step with the word of God, we're in step with the supreme law of this land. And it's fundamentally our allegiance to Christ and his headship over the church where he sets the terms of worship that has us at odds with our government. And so we aren't the political revolutionaries. They're the political revolutionaries. Amen? Amen. We're simply following. We're simply obeying him and doing what we've always done for his honor and his glory. And so the Christian is never to suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a troublesome meddler. And we can even say as a political revolutionary, we are not political revolutionaries. If you have a political revolution in mind, that is not what this is about. You are in the wrong place. This is about the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. There's shame in suffering as an evildoer, but there's no shame in suffering as a Christian. It's an occasion to glorify God. In fact, shame when suffering as a Christian is a frightening reality. You say, well, what does it mean to suffer as a Christian? It means everything we've been saying it means. It means to suffer as a follower of Christ. It's to suffer because of your obedience to Christ, your allegiance to Christ. And so why is shame such a frightening reality because of what Jesus says. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels, Luke 9, 26. To be ashamed as one suffers as a Christian, is to be ashamed of Christ himself. It's to be ashamed of his words, of his name, of what he represents. And again, we're brought back to the implications of present suffering for future glory. This is the other side of the equation, a settled shame when suffering as a Christian will result in shame at Christ's coming. 
What is happening in the present has implications for the future. Either implications for exaltation or implications for shame. And so Christian, don't be ashamed. Jesus suffered, didn't he? The apostles, disciples of the apostles, faithful men throughout history, they suffered. And they weren't ashamed. Some even burned at the stake, declaring their love for God. Don't be ashamed. When you suffer as a Christian, you are being given a moment to glorify God. Rejoice that you have been counted worthy to share in the sufferings of Christ, that it's indicative that the spirit of glory and of God rests on you, knowing what it signals about future glory and joy. Do not be ashamed. Instead, glorify God in it. But it might be helpful to ask, why this suffering? Why has God appointed this suffering for the church? And we've touched on that. It's for your testing, for my testing, for our testing. But Peter explains it further in verse 17. And so if you're taking notes, jot down forth the explanation for suffering. The explanation for suffering, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Really? Judgment for the household of God? Didn't Jesus receive our judgment In our place, doesn't Paul say, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? How can Peter say, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God? Because it's not that kind of judgment. It's not a judgment with respect to sin. We've already said that. Jesus took that. There's there's no share in that suffering. We'll never experience suffering for our sin, period, paragraph. This is a purifying kind of judgment. It's a judgment that purifies the church. You say, well, how? Well, in two ways. One, as already mentioned, it separates the true from the false. When this judgment of purification comes upon the church, those who aren't in Christ fall away because the cost to follow him becomes too great. And so they retreat to their basement, as it were. And two, it purifies because it sanctifies us it conforms us more fully into the image of Christ. This judgment that Peter's referring to here is a a refining kind of judgment. It's, It's preparing us. It's preparing the bride of Christ, purifying the bride of Christ for when the bridegroom comes. This is preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is to make us ready for heaven to wean us from the things of this world, to to make us long for heaven with greater longing and affection, to cause us to lay aside encumbrances and weights and the sin that so easily entangles us. To make us ready for the coming of Christ. Now look at the next part of verse 17. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? 
I mean, this is an argument from the lesser to the greater. Judgment beginning with the household of God signals certain judgment for those who do not obey the gospel of God. And their outcome will be eternal damnation, the unmitigated justice of God for their sins. And just think, the suffering Peter has in mind here in this passage comes from who? It comes from unbelievers, which means what? That the persecution they execute only increases their judgment. The persecution that is lodged at the true body of Christ by the unbelieving world is storing up wrath against themselves for the day of judgment. In fact, listen to the way the Apostle Paul expresses this. You can even turn and look at it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 and following. He says this to a group of persecuted Christians. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This is the fate of those who afflict the true body of Christ and never come to a saving knowledge of the truth. We receive momentary light affliction that produces for us an eternal weight of glory. They receive divine retribution and eternal destruction. In fact, Peter reiterates this sentiment in verse 18, back in our text. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, stop there, and it is. It is with difficulty that the righteous is saved. Jesus says you must walk a narrow path, not just enter a narrow gate, but walk a narrow way. And the apostle Peter in Acts 14, 22 says it is through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And so again, verse 18, if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Certain, eternal, never-ending judgment. And both in the passage in 2 Thessalonians 1 and here in 1 Peter 4, you'll note the gospel must be obeyed. The gospel is a command. It's a command to turn from your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. And you must do this. You must respond in this way. You must believe on him. Because if you don't, then you will experience the the judgment that we've been looking at already in these verses. God is a holy God. He is the one true and living God, and he is holy in two senses. One, he is transcendent. There is none besides him. He is exalted above all, and two, he is perfect in moral purity. He is righteous through and through. There is not even a hint of darkness in him. And he created this world initially, and it was good. He spoke it into existence. He, he, he created Adam and Eve. He gave them one prohibition, and it was good. Until Adam violated the command. 
and plunged himself and the entire human race into sin. And now every seed of Adam, every descendant of Adam, which is all of us, come into this world spiritually dead, born in sin, unable to glorify God, unable to to please him in any respect, even any effort of our own to earn favor with God through deeds of righteousness are nothing but a filthy rag in his sight. Left in that condition, we're finished. And just think, search your heart and conscience, friend. You know that there are innumerable violations of the righteousness of God. You know that you have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. You know. You know there are matters in your life that are wrong. And so left in that state, you you have no, no hope of anything but certain judgment. You are the godless man and sinner of verse 18. But God in his mercy and grace sent forth his son to come and become man, that he would dwell among us, that he would take our humanity upon himself, though being without sin, And he lived a life that we couldn't. And then he went to the cross and died the death that we deserve. Where he bore in his own body our sins on the cross, became a curse, the eternal son. He died on that cross. He went into the grave and he rose again on the third day. You know now where he's seated, right? He is seated at the right hand of God. And if you would turn from your sin and believe on him, looking to him alone, looking to his righteousness, looking to his work, repudiating anything in yourself, rejecting all effort and all claims to self-righteousness, casting yourself entirely upon Christ, you will be saved. You'll receive a righteousness that is alien to you. It'll be the righteousness of Christ counted to you. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. You'll be sealed for the day of redemption. He will indwell you. And you will have entered through that narrow gate and will be now on that narrow way where you will encounter the same path of suffering that we're currently experiencing with the blessing of knowing that as you experience that suffering and even to the the degree that you do, you have every reason to rejoice because it will mean exaltation at the coming of Christ. And so believe on him this day. Be reconciled to God through his son. That would be our prayer. That's the explanation for suffering. It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and our time has come. We are receiving the judgment of purification. We're being made ready for the bridegroom, and it's a privileged place to be, even if unpleasant at times. Fifth and finally, if you're taking notes, jot this down, the end of suffering the end of suffering. And by that, I mean the aim or goal of suffering. Verse 19, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. The aim of our suffering is to suffer according to the will of God. So what's God's will in our suffering? Everything we've been seeing in these verses, that we would rejoice and be glad in it, that we would glorify God and not be ashamed, and hear that we would entrust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And that's a command too as well. 
We are commanded to entrust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Just as we're commanded to rejoice and commanded to glorify God. And it's this last ingredient, this this exhortation, this command to entrust ourselves to a faithful creator in doing what is right that should remind you of someone. It should remind you of Christ. Right here in this epistle, look back at chapter 2. Verse 21 and following, for you have been called for this purpose. Peter is speaking to his readers and by extension to us. For you have been called for this purpose, chapter 2 and verse 21, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Remember, we're not without sin in the way that Christ was, but we're not to suffer as a murderer or as a, a troublesome meddler or as an evildoer or thief. Verse 23, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he offered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's what Jesus did. He suffered injustice. He, he received the unjust suffering that was, that, was, that was afflicted, that afflicted him, and he entrusted himself to the Father. And we're called to follow in his footsteps. And God is faithful. Was he not faithful to Christ? Peter identifies God here as the the faithful creator. And he identifies him as creator because him as creator marks out his role as judge. He is faithful, and absolutely every wrong will be made right. God is going to make all things new, as we were reminded last week. He is going to settle every wrong. Everything is going to be dealt with, either at the cross of Christ or at the judgment that comes upon the ungodly and the wicked. And so we entrust ourselves to a faithful creator who has the rightful role as judge and who executes that judgment through the judgment of his son. And so don't grow weary in doing good. Press on, Christian. Put one foot in front of the next. Look to the power of the Spirit within you to enable you unto all obedience. Suffer according to the will of God. Again, this is vital instruction if we're going to suffer in this way. And so what can we conclude then about our present suffering? We can conclude this, that this isn't some strange thing that's happening to us, that it's divinely appointed by God that it's reason to rejoice since it's the prelude to rejoicing with exaltation at the coming of Christ, that it's evidence that the spirit of glory and of God rests on us, that we are richly blessed on account of that, that we have no reason to be ashamed, but instead are to glorify God and that we're being made ready for the bridegroom since it's with difficulty that the righteous are saved. And finally, that we can entrust ourselves to him who judges righteously since he is our heavenly father. And so take courage, Christian. The glory and joy that awaits you will make this momentary light affliction seem like a vapor that passes in the wind. Let's pray. 